Let me read to you a passage from the sixth chapter of St John's Gospel, verses 52 to 59. It's the Gospel for Friday after the third Sunday of Easter. St John writes, Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. That's from John chapter 6 verse 52 to 59 in which our Lord speaks of the Eucharist. Martin Luther began the conflagration, taking up where Wycliffe and Huss left off a century or more before them. Following his break from Rome, many of the Protestant creeds gradually fell into oblivion, but the institutes of religion of John Calvin were recognised more and more as the sum of reformed theology. After 1560, the Jesuit St. Peter Canisius said that Calvin appeared to be taking Luther's place, even among the Germans. Three currents have ever since held their course in the development of Protestantism. There is the mystic current, derived from Wittenberg, there is the logical orthodox current from Geneva, and the heterodox rationalist current from Zurich, Zwingli this last being greatly increased thanks to the Unitarians of Italy, Occino, Fausto and Lelio Succino. To the modern world, however, Calvin stands peculiarly for the Reformation and his doctrine is popularly assumed to represent and explain the Gospel. One of the curious things about all this is that a highly refined individual system in Calvin's institutes, not traceable as a whole, to any previous age, supplanted the public and Catholic consent of both East and West of numerous centuries since apostolic times. Take the Holy Eucharist. The Catholic consent on the Eucharist since the days of the Apostles and present in the Catholic Church, Eastern Orthodoxy, Oriental Orthodoxy and the Church of the East taught that the reality or substance of the bread and wine is wholly changed into the body and blood of Christ, the appearances remaining. The Catholic Church used the term transubstantiation to express what is changed. It does not denote how this change occurs, which is the acknowledged mystery. It reminds us of the question asked in the Gospel that I read earlier. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Luther decided that the body and blood of Jesus are present in, with and under the forms of bread and wine, leaving the reality of bread unchanged. Well, there does not appear to be any real mystery in this. Calvin believed in an immaterial, spiritual or pneumatic presence of Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit and received by faith. So there was even less of a mystery there. Anglicans adhere to a range of views although the teaching on the matter in the Articles of Religion holds that the presence is real only in a heavenly and spiritual sense. Some Christians reject any real presence, believing it to be but a memorial of Christ. Now nowhere in the sixth chapter of St John's Gospel, which is given over to the doctrine of the Eucharist, does Christ tell his audience not to take him literally. The context of John chapter 6 verse 52 to 59, which is the passage I read earlier, shows that not only the people but also the disciples 
took him literally. They left because of this understanding. Jesus knew how they understood. He did not correct their understanding and let them leave him. The question that rumbled among his disciples was, how could this be done? Jesus made no attempt to show how his body could be eaten and his flesh could be drunk. He simply and unambiguously taught that this is what would happen and that, and that they had to accept it on his word. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Christ's almighty power as God was the foundation of the doctrine, and his word was the motive for accepting it. Would not it have been easier on everyone if Christ had launched into an explanation of how he could do it? After all, he as God knew how it could and would be done. He as God would have known the best way of explaining the mystery, but he did not. He did not even explain to the crowds what we all now know, that Christ would offer his body and blood to us sacramentally. He did not even explain to the crowds that he would change the bread in and wine into his body and blood while retaining the appearances and qualities of bread and wine. All this would be shown to the apostles the night before he died at the Last Supper. During the occasion in the synagogue of Capernaum, when he publicly announced the doctrine of the Eucharist and when he lost very many of his disciples, Christ simply announced the fact, not how it could be so. It is indeed the mystery of our faith, but how powerful a reality it is. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And again, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. The true doctrine is the Catholic doctrine. But it is the mystery of our faith, and it is pointless endeavouring to show how it can be done. Christ did not launch into an explanation of that. Our source for knowing that it is so is simply the word of Christ, to which the Church has borne witness ever since the beginnings. The Holy Eucharist is the summit and source of our Christian life, and it is the summit and the source of the life of the entire Church. Our life would find its focus in the Holy Eucharist, which is to say, in the Eucharistic Jesus present and acting in Mass and present in the tabernacle of each Catholic Church, by day and by night, awaiting our acknowledgement and our devotion. Let us never neglect the Eucharist then.